Hello and welcome back to another video with it's Dr. Dan and today we're going to be learning about the world of buffers. So in this particular video, this is an introductory video to understand what the concept of a buffer is and how exactly you can pick and choose how to make a buffer. So with this one, the idea of what a buffer solution is, is that it maintains the pH by resisting changes in the pH. So meaning that if you add a very tiny amount of acid or base, it's going to neutralize that acid or base. So what the whole idea here is I have I've drawn here is I have a buffer solution on the, the left hand side here. And what we have inside is a little pH probe. So when you dip a probe in the solution, it lets you know the pH. Now, if you add an acid to it or a base, one thing is you're going to notice is that the concentration is did not change much. It originally was at a seven and currently at the moment you see that's at a 6.9 after you made it more acidic. And it's at a 7.1 when you made it more basic on the other side, right? So there was not much of a change. So when it comes to add a buffer, it resists change. The pH is relatively maintained. It's an equilibrium process. So meaning that you tried to make the reaction go forward, but it resisted it. It went back. So whenever we are looking at this compared to, let's say, a solution of water, for example, well, if I have just water with my probe, I'll measure the pH and it's a seven, right? That's the normal pH for neutral water. Now, if I add an acid to it, you're going to see that the pH is going to change very, very quickly. So see this at a four. The, I add the exact same amount of acid to the buffered one and to the to the to water and it changed dramatically, right? It changed drastically. If I add a base, the same amount that I added above, to water, it changed all the way to an 11, you see that it went a huge difference. So pH changes an insane amount when you just add it to water or any regular solution when an acid or base is added, a buffer resists. So how does that exactly work? Let's take a look. The whole idea of when it comes to buffers is they, re they essentially resist the pH change when we add acids or bases. Now, something like this is extremely important, especially when it comes to the human body. The body has natural buffer systems built into it to help essentially preserve cellular and body function. And the main reason it does that is because essentially all the food and drinks and beverages you eat and drink are all very acidic and very basic and will affect the pH balance of your, your system. One big example of that is, let's say if you eat like a lot of acidic fatty food maybe, and you get a really upset stomach, well, that's because you had a little bit too much acid in your system. But over time, you're going to feel better and your body will, retain, will get back to its state of equilibrium. So the body essentially absorbs uh, protons or H3O plus and hydroxides to maintain. This is very important for how your cells and how your blood, blood functions within the body. Um, whenever it comes to something like trying to maintain the pH, what it's essentially doing is by neutralizing with the different components of it, it's going to help it stabilize. So let's try to take a little bit, a little bit farther. Look exactly how how does this work? You didn't exactly explain it. Let's go even farther. Have a weak acid or base, and it's with its conjugate partner. It will resist pH changes. So whenever you have a whenever you have an acid or a base added, it's going to actually neutralize that acid or base and help maintain pH by resisting the change. Now, one thing that makes that so important is that the human body absorbs acids and bases, and the way it absorbs us from all the food and drinks that essentially we ingest on a regular everyday basis. And from your natural cellular processes of just keeping you running on an, on a day to day, day on just a regular day to day. So if you eat and drink, you know whatever it is. Let's say if you have like fast food or soda or something, or even just any like sugary or any fruit drinks. A lot of them are very acidic, which if you have them, it's going to offset the pH of your body. But the thing is, your body has built in buffer systems to make sure that doesn't happen. Because if you drank one acidic thing. It'd be like poison and you'd fall over dead, but that doesn't happen. Why? 
Um, so essentially, whenever you have a buffer, it's very important to cell and blood function. It maintains the pH. So one big example is that your blood, with all of your blood cells in it, is a giant buffer system. And one example of that is, let's say if I have a carbonic acid, which is in your blood, and we were to combine that with its conjugate base, it would help maintain the system. So its conjugate base, in this case, if you remember, differs from one single proton, will help maintain that pH. And the other beauty of something like carbonic acid is that it can even go one more step to help hold whether it's more acidic or more basic, depending on how you're breathing, how your body's functioning, it will maintain it. But let's take a look at how we make it and try to make this make a little more sense. So now the whole idea of what are the different components of a buffer. So as I said before, it has to be the conjugate acid base pair, meaning that generally we take a weak acid and we combine it with the salt of its conjugate base, and they have to be in equal concentrations. So let's take a look at what that exactly represents through an example. So let's say if I want to create a buffer of acetic acid, we would need a salt of its conjugate base. Now, the salt is added to provide a higher concentration of the conjugate base, because if you add just acetic acid into solution, it barely dissociates, so it's not going to have a lot of it in there. So let's try to take a look and try to understand how do we pick which salt that we have. So if I have acetic acid, well, if I lose, let's say, a proton and dissociate in water, so if we have an H+, what's going to be left? We're going to have C2H3O2- minus as its conjugate base. So if we have the conjugate base, and then we have an acid, well, what could I use as a salt for this particular thing? Well, some examples of that would be if essentially any alkali metal bonded to that, uh, to that acetate ion. So let's say if I took sodium acetate and I bonded those two together. So if we just take our acetate and cut and, cut and paste that, we can bond those two different pieces together. This would be one example. Another example of a salt could be like maybe potassium acetate could be another one. Essentially anything that has that salt component to help create that ion. Because if I take, let's say, sodium acetate and I were to throw that into solution, well, what exactly would you make? You'd make sodium, right? And the acetate ion. So you would need to add both of them into a solution to make that buffer. It consists of both. So let's say if I wanted to pick how you would make the best buffer solution possible if they were mixed in equal portions. How would you do that? Well, the first little checkbox is that it needs to be a weak acid, right? So either a weak acid or a weak base. So let's just go with a weak acid to make it easier. So what we are going to do is we're going to add an X to anything that's considered to be a strong acid. That means no. So let's look at anything that can't be used. So if I go through my candidates here, we want to kind of look at our different acids that are available. So if we highlight our acids, we have a bunch of them. Which one of these are considered to be strong, weak? What do we have? Well, the first thing that you have is we have HBr, right? HBr is one of your strong acids. It's bromic acid. So even though it were, it's going to be with its salt, it won't, it will be too many ions in solution. There won't be enough of the original one in there. So that's a no. Now, if I have the next one, HCN and HI, are they a pair? Well, remember, they have to differ by a single proton. And if I compare these two molecules, they differ by a carbon and a nitrogen. That's a big no. That's not going to be okay. Um, if we go to the next one, well, if I compare H2CO3 and sodium, bicarbonate, do these, do these differ by a single proton? And you'll see that it is. It's different by just one proton, and we have that sodium. So that's a salt. So that tells you, hey, you, have, you found your salt that's here. That's what the sodium part is. And what is the essential uh, part of H2CO3 is that it needs to be able to dissociate to make HCO3 minus, OK? Now, even looking at the other ones, right? HI makes I minus and 
H plus. That doesn't that didn't match either. Now, so that could be a really good candidate. So let's put a little green check mark. Now, is it the best? I don't know yet. So if we look at the last one, right, that that's this other one, this HI, that's a strong acid. So that's a no. And the last one is sodium hydroxide and water. Well, water is considered to be the acid here. Would this be considered to dissociate the right way? So if I take H2O, it would make H plus and OH minus. Well, OH minus and sodium are together. But once again, sodium hydroxide, what is that? That's a strong base. So that's going to be a no as well. So we found our choice with carbonic acid because that is with its salt. So this is how you pick out the correct buffer. It needs to be a weak acid with its conjugate base salt. And you can do the same with a weak base and its conjugate acid as well. But generally, it's more common to use a weak acid. Let's take a look at another example. Which of the following would make the best buffer solution if mixed in roughly equal proportions? So here we don't have pairs. We have all these individual pieces. So the first thing you kind of want to do is let's try to see if we can eliminate any um, common pairs so that, or especially anything that's considered a strong acid or a base. So if we kind of look over here, well, what exactly can we use? What can we use? So we have the first one. You can see that we have HCl. HCl is a strong acid. So what we can kind of quickly do is we can say that's a no. That's not going to quite work. Um, from there, we have a couple weak. We have we want to look for any other acids that can be used. So we have a phosphoric acid as a choice. Um, and then, then there's no other acid that's available to us. So if we were to look at this, well, H33PO4, if essentially if that were to dissociate, you would need H2PO4 minus, um, and that needs to be connected to some kind of salt. So can we see anything that would quite match? And if you look below it, well, essentially KH2PO4 uh, almost matches perfectly, right? They are almost identically the same. In this case, you have the salt stabilizing it. So these two would be a great pair to have for your answer. Now, what about the last one? We have lithium, we have lithium uh, with LIBRO, and then NABRA is the other one, NABRO. They're both salts, but neither one of them is an acid, so that's going to be a no-go. And then NACL is just a salt, so that's not going to be okay either. So we have our pair. And that's the whole idea of this, is can we try to pick which one we have? So when it comes to buffers, they resist your pH changes, and that's the whole idea. Now, the last concept about buffers is all about this idea that we can actually quantify how the buffer actually works. So before we talked about how we can make a buffer and, and somewhat how what it is doing, so just to emphasize that most important fact, is that a buffer, it is absorbing either the acidic quality, which is the H plus or H3O plus from solution, or the OH minus. And the whole idea is that it tries to maintain the pH at where it's designed to be. Now, with a buffer, this does it within a certain capacity. So this is referred to as the buffer capacity. It can hold the pH within one of wherever the buffer is designed to work. So Every single chemical series of buffers works at a different pH value. And this is something we can calculate, which I'll show you how to do just for a more uh, basic, simple buffer for how this whole idea works. So just to kind of illustrate it, at least the way that I can think how to make this make sense, is that a buffer, the whole idea first is that you have the acid and it, the salt of its conjugate base. And with, when both molarities of each one equal each other, you have your buffer. So this is the pH where it works. Now, the concept here is, let's say if I want to kind of play with the actual chemical reaction here. So if I have an acid and I add it to water and I have the conjugate base, how does this concept work? Well, it's all about equilibrium and how it can shift from one way to another. The goal is to keep the reaction in the middle. So if all of a sudden I decide to increase the amount of base in the solution, well, what is the buffer going to exactly do? Well, when we increase that, it's going to try to absorb it, right? It's going to try to keep it into the center here. Now, so when you add more base to the solution, it has to respond to that. Is it going to let it become basic? 
Well, no, or the entire system is going to fall apart. What's going to happen then is being that this whole reaction here has this double arrow that we've talked about before, well, the reaction can either happen in the forward direction or in the reverse. So if all of a sudden I decide to increase the basic side, which is the A minus, well, what is going to happen to, to essentially to change this? Well, the, the system is going to respond. And instead, it's going to actually try to shift the reaction backwards. It's like, oh, there's too much product laying around. So in order to change the scales of this reaction and how everything is balanced, it's going to shift it back. So when all of a sudden you increase a lot of base here, you're going to now see that the reaction is going to shift back to the center. It's going to try to hold it there. And that's what a buffer does. It neutralizes all these different components as being added to you like your blood or your circulatory system, when you introduce something that's basic to your body or acidic, your body is trying to maintain its levels so that it can operate appropriately. It has to be kept in the middle. So if I do the opposite, where all of a sudden I'm like, well, I want to now uh, have all these acids in my body. So let's say you drink a bunch of soda or you uh, have a bunch of energy drinks or coffee. Well, what's your body going to do? Is it just going to let it become acidic and allow it to kind of poison itself? No, it's going gonna, it's gonna to fight back. So when you have something that's very acidic being added to your body, well, instead of it shifting uh, in the reverse direction like we did before, it's now going to cause it to shift forward in order to neutralize itself. So being that when we increase a ton of acid, it's now going to shift forward to respond to that change. It's all about, is there a response? And that's how the idea of buffers. They respond and resist the change of pH. Let's try to look at this one basic calculation to finish this video. So when it comes to actually trying to analyze where does your buffer work, this is all about understanding what is the Ka value and actually eventually deriving an equation that can be used to be able to determine how well does your buffer work. So if I had the following, it says that the Ka for acetic acid uh, is 1.8 times 10 to the negative five. What is the pH of the buffer uh, that is prepared with one molar acetic acid and then one molar of acetate ion, which is the conjugate base? So if I were to do that, how would the entire thing work? How would we set this up, right? We never talked about something like this before. Well, the one thing we can do is we can set up a Ka equation, being that we have a Ka. So what we will first do is, well, if you remember, is that Ka so is equal to the products over the reactants of your formula. So if we have our Ka, what we will do is put our products, which in this case is H3O uh, or H3O plus, and we have our acetic acid. And remember, all these are referred to uh, in brackets as well. So we have our products all over the reactants. And then we'll take that expression now from here what we can essentially do is we can kind of rearrange it to actually solve for what is the ph well so exactly how do you do that well if you kind of remember from your equations is that ph is equal to the negative log of oh of negative log of h3o plus so what we have to actually do is rearrange this formula to get h3o plus by itself. So can we do that? Well, if we kind of do some mathematics just to sort of cancel things out. So for example, if I were to look at this and I were to, let's say, multiply both sides by the acid and base, so to cancel things out. So let's kind of move things around. So what, right, what I'm doing here is I essentially am multiplying by the opposites. So that way everything cancels our units. So as we can see, the conjugate base cancels the acid cancels. So we're multiplying and dividing by the different sides. So when we do that, we now have on the right hand side, the Ka multiplied by the conjugate uh, by the acid and the conjugate base. So both those concentrations. So we're sort of rearranging this equation in order to get H3O plus by itself. Now the whole reason we're doing this is so that way we can actually find the pH. Now, the last step is all about, well, in order to find pH, you have to take the negative log of everything. 
So if we kind of do do the take the negative log of our H3O plus concentration, we would have pH is equal to the negative log of Ka times the negative log of our concentrations. So now why is this something that's so important? Well, this is essentially how we define the Henderson-Hasselbach equation, which is quite the complicated name. So now what this whole idea is by deriving this, this, P, this Ka with a negative log is actually known as something known as the pKa. So what we do here is we take that negative log of the Ka, negative log of our, of our acids and bases, and it actually we can plug all of our different components in that we started with the problem. So if I take my pH is equal to negative log of our Ka value, which from earlier was 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5, and then essentially we multiply that by the negative log of our concentrations, which were 1 over 1, so it was 1 mole divided by 1 mole, and the whole thing is that number over there is going to end up canceling out. And once we put all this into our calculator by taking the negative log of 1.8 times 10 to the negative fifth, times it by the negative log of 1 divided by 1, what we're going to get is the pH of where this buffer works, which after we place that into your calculator, you're going to get a pH of 4.74 is where this buffer works. So if you had acetic acid as a buffer, it would be able to maintain a pH right around 4.74, which to kind of let you know, it's like to go back up to the example I had earlier. So earlier I talked about, well, if the concentrations were equal to each other, which is what we had, well then essentially the buffer would be able to hold right around 4.74. So it could either increase the pH by one or decrease it by one. So within our buffer capacity, it could hold the pH from anywhere from 3.74 all the way to 5.74 in order to maintain it within a pH of 2. Now this is very critically important for biological systems which have enzymes and proteins um, that essentially are very sensitive to the pH. Without them being in their very specific ranges, they will denature, they will cease to function correctly, they won't be able to react properly. So this is the general idea of things that you'll see in physiology and in future courses. So this is the idea with buffers, uh, just to be able to wrap this up. So let's take a look at our final thoughts. The most important concept here is that the buffers resist pH. You can do a lot of calculations with these, but this is something that's beyond the scope of introductory chemistry, but it will be featured in future videos later on um, in terms of other courses that are on this page. But when it comes here, buffer just maintains the pH and resists that change, which is the ultimate thing here. You need the weak acid with, with its conjugate base, and that's how you pick it. So you have to know what a buffer is because it's something that's commonly used in all biology classes, especially in physiology, microbiology, and in chem, chemistry 1B, and in, any, in a lot of different chemical engineering applications as well. Thank you so much for listening. I hope this helped. And if, it, if you need help, please reach out to me and let me know if there's anything that I can do to help. Um, if, if you are someone that needs help with your course, feel free to either message me or comment below. Let me know what you thought. Um, and if this is your first time here, hit that like and subscribe button and support the video. I really appreciate that. And thank you so much for listening. I hope you have a wonderful day and I'll see you later. Bye now.